Father, um, thank you. We want to continue to, um, to hear from you today and to respond to you. We know your presence is here, so Lord, I, I, right now I ask that you would help us all um, to be uh, responsive and faithful in listening to what you have. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated, I believe our kids can go to Kids Church. Yay! They really like you, Terry. It's awesome. And I want to highlight, um, this. we're heading into Holy Week, so I um, just want to remind you to be sure you take a bulletin with you when you go today. Um, uh, throughout today, uh, we have uh, the Stations of the Cross, where you can come here until 6 o'clock tonight, and you can go through uh, all 15 Stations of the Cross and pray and reflect on what Jesus did for us on his journey to the cross. And then also, uh, to remind you, Thursday uh, night, you can come back here at 7 o'clock. We're going to have a, a Monday, Thursday uh, time of uh, communion and worship. And it will be here in the sanctuary. We want to invite you back for that. And our Good Friday community service will be Friday uh, at the Church of Christ uh, right here in town. It's right, um, if you know where Hall Funeral Home is, the Church of Christ is kind of behind that. So you'll see it there. I invite you to come out for that at 1 o'clock on Good Friday. Also, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, beforehand, we are sharing in breakfast together in the morning. We want to invite you to be part of, of bringing um, a continental type of breakfast thing. And there's a sign up for that in the back if you would want to sign up for that or make plans for that. We appreciate that. I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of, of Luke, chapter 19. Matthew, Mark, and then Luke in the New Testament. Luke, chapter 19. We're going to begin our reading a little later on with verse 28 of Luke, chapter 19. Father, before I look into your word again, before we um, listen to you, and I ask that you would help me to handle the scripture in the right way. And Lord, this needs to be a time that's about your truth for us, not my ideas. So Lord, help me and help us to receive what you have for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Early in the service, I, I talked with you about John uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Last week, Pastor Steve shared with us uh, about this important conversation that a Pharisee named Nicodemus had with Jesus. And um, he reminded us that Nicodemus came to Jesus wanting to learn from him knowing that it was important to have this conversation with him. And one of the things that, that I come away from, was, from that is this. Nicodemus knew that he had to respond to the truth of who Jesus is. That which is true, that which is truth, requires and demands a response. No one can be neutral when it comes to that which is true. The message of the cross to Christ is truth. It's real. The living God is real. It is truth. There's no such thing as remaining neutral in light of the message of the cross to Christ. It demands a response. It requires a response. So I want to ask us this question today, because the truth is, God wants to hear from you. And God desires for us to hear from Him. I know that's true, because He's given me His Word, and He's preserved His Word. People think sometimes, or they ask me sometimes, why doesn't God speak to me today? And I'm getting older now, and I'm a little more grumpy, and I will likely tell them, 
Have you read the Bible today? Because God speaks to us every day if we allow him to. And the more you seek to walk in relationship with him, the more you seek to listen to him, the more you will hear him. I promise you that. So I want to ask us this question today. Have you had conversation with Jesus about the condition of your soul? Whether you're in a good place or a bad place, have you had a conversation with Jesus about the condition of your soul? That's so important. I had people in my life who, uh, who for, for a long time have been faithful and asking me, how are you doing? How are you really doing? How is it with your soul? And then when you walk through times of uncertainty or times that you didn't choose to walk through, such as my wife and I are going through, people find it all the more need to ask me that question. And sometimes I'm like, really? But you know what? God is faithful. Because there are so many times where I need to be reminded, you know what? Have that conversation with God today. Talk to him about where you are. Be reminded about how he cares for you and how he goes before you. John 3.16, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about his need for redemption for eternal life. Redemption, that word, is the action of being saved. It's the, the action of being rescued from, from sin or rescued from error. Jesus is God's plan of redemption. Jesus Jesus is the way that we are rescued and saved from the grip of sin. It is only through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. He came to set us free from the bondage of sin, and that is the core of the gospel message. The gospel means good news because the good news is Jesus came and made a way for you to be saved and rescued from that which you could do nothing about. Every single one of us is powerless to do anything about the condition of our soul, of our spiritual life. We need Jesus. We need a Savior. To accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, to accept all that he is, is to be set free from the bondage of sin. It is the core of the gospel message. And if I were to preach, if I were to preach a message that communicated that there was any other way and I would be a liar. If I were to preach a message that was simply just life advice and talked about nice things about Jesus, but never talked about that he is the only way to salvation, I would be a liar. This is the beginning of Holy Week. This is God underlying, underlining the fact that we need a Savior. Look with, me at Luke, look with me at Luke chapter 19. Go to verse 28 of chapter 19. It says, After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there with, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks out on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to, joyful, began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Can you picture it? A grown man on a colt that had never been ridden was probably exciting in its own way. 
And Jesus is on it, and there's all these people, and they're waving palm branches. And we saw a little bit, right? We saw a little bit of it this morning. I love it. Waving palm branches. And they're, they're laying their coats down and branches down, and they're making this royal path for Jesus to come on. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As they approached Jerusalem and saw, and saw the city, he wept over it. He said, if, if even you had known on this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and the, and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling it is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, and you've made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests and teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. At first Palm Sunday, just six days before Passover, Jesus and his disciples, along with thousands of others, were approaching the city of Jerusalem. Passover was a huge celebration. So there, it was already a time where there would be a lot of energy and a lot of excitement. And there were, there were people along the road, but this time there was even more so. Jesus had been very public with his ministry, and in recent days, Jesus had been doing these incredible miracles. It wasn't long before this where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been dead for four days. The Bible says he had been dead long enough where he smelled bad. And Jesus came and prayed and spoke, and Lazarus rose from the dead and came from the grave that had been witnessed by many of the people that were there that day. And the ones who saw it had told others. And as these, this, this crowd of people was making their way to Jerusalem for Passover, they continued to hear and to see how Jesus was teaching and how he was healing and how he was moving. So the air was thick with excitement, and the question was asked, could this be the Messiah? Surely he is the one. This is the one who is the fulfillment of prophecy. This is the one who will bring us freedom. So they were shouting, Hosanna. They were shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were filled with joy. Wondering, is this the one who's going to bring us some relief from this Roman rule that we've been enduring? Will he bring political relief? But this was much more than that. I'm glad my hope is not in a political leader. They will fail you if you haven't noticed. My hope is in Jesus Christ because he didn't come that day to be a political king. He came that day because he is king of kings. Amen? Jesus was arriving so that we might know what it is to be rescued, to be redeemed. He was coming in to celebrate Passover. Passover was a time of remembering, remembering how God had worked using his servant Moses to deliver the children of Israel from the bondage they had then and in Egypt for over 400 years. And re, you know, remember, if you read in Exodus, you see how, how God continued to do battle with Pharaoh, calling Moses, let the people go, and there would be plague after plague, and Pharaoh continued to harden his heart and would not relent. And finally God brought this judgment, and the judgment would, would take the life of the firstborn sons, and, and they were all guilty. We've all sinned, and it was true then. And God told the children of Israel, you will be protected, but you must sacrifice the lamb. A lamb without blemish. And when you sacrifice the lamb, he gave instructions as to how it was to happen. And he told them to put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts of their homes. And they would be redeemed. They would be rescued. 
and following us they would be set free from bondage in Egypt. The Passover was, they were commanded at that time to remember how the Lord had saved them and how the Lord had rescued them from bondage in Egypt. And, and Passover was a time of, of, of remembering and it was also a time of, of sacrifice, of knowing that it is only through the shed blood of the innocent lamb that we are set free from sin. It was about casting off of sin. So it was no mistake that Jesus was arriving in the way he was arriving. At the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, when John the Baptist was baptizing in the Jordan, remember what John said when he saw Jesus there? Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Remember what uh, Jesus said to the 72 followers of Christ when he sent them out to do ministry. He empowered them to, uh, to heal the sick and to proclaim uh, freedom. And he empowered them to do everything he had been doing. And as he sent them out, he said, don't take anything with you. Depend on God for everything. And then he says, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. And I used to read that. I used to only think about that, meaning, oh, man, it's going to be hard for me. But when I think about Jesus, the Lamb of God, and I think about how he says to his followers, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. I want the power of the blood of the Lamb working in my life. Those people were empowered by God. I don't want to live in this life any other way than covered by the blood of the Lamb. Because the blood of the Lamb defeats the wolf. It's the blood of the lamb that defeated death and sin in the grave. So Jesus came into the city that day, the lamb of God, knowing, knowing that the time of sacrifice was going to change because he was going to take on all that sin for himself. Because of the Lamb of God that we can come into this place and we can sing and we can pray. We can come before a God who is holy and pure and righteous, not because of anything we could do for ourselves, but because of everything that Jesus did for us. We need atonement for our sins. We need a lamb. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Holy Spirit's cleaning my sinuses out today. <laughs> Pastor Steve shared with us from Zechariah from the message in the, um, in the NIV. It reads this way: Rejoice greatly, old daughter of Jerusalem! See, your king is coming to you, riding on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. Jesus did not arrive that day in the way that one might have expected a king to arrive at that time. He did not come displaying military might. He did not come uh, in a way where, like a military general with all these armies around him saying, I'm taking over, I'm the one in authority. He didn't come in that way. He didn't come saying, look at me, I should be ruler because I'm the richest and, and wealthiest person around. He didn't display a bunch of wealth. He came in with the people in the most humble of ways. Came as a prince of peace. Peace that brings a sense of order in the midst of chaos. Godly, godly peace eliminates the chaos of sin. It does away with it. And Jesus came in this way, bringing peace that only he could bring. And as he approached the city that day, the Bible says that Jesus began to weep. He says, if only you had known on this day what would bring you peace, but for now it is hidden from your eyes. You ever wonder why Jesus wept? 
I cry sometimes, but it's not the same as weeping. I mean, when I watch Rudy, I cry. Some of you cry at Hallmark movies. Right? We watch some of those things and we cry. But weeping's different, isn't it? I mean, we, we weep when we have sorrow in our heart. We weep. We weep sometimes when we have a burden for someone that we love. We weep sometimes when, when God's Spirit moves on us and we realize that, there, that, that I do not deserve what God has given me. Jesus looked over the city that day and he wept. Now, long before, the, the Gospels tell us that when Jesus went to his friend Lazarus and found that he was dead and in the grave and, and there was so much distress there and they, the Bible says Jesus wept. Sometimes people will say that's the first verse of the Bible ever memorized, Jesus wept. It's one of the most important verses that you can memorize. Jesus wept because people weren't seeing the glory of God. Jesus wept that day over Lazarus because he said, if only you would see God's glory. He wept looking over the city. If only you had known what would bring you salvation. Jesus has wept over me so many times, and he's wept over you. Oh, Lord, help us. Jesus looks at the church today. Ours and others. And there are times he looks at us and he weeps. He weeps. I've been pastoring here for 18 years, I promise you. There have been a day, there have been, there's been more than one day where I've come in on a Sunday morning. I'm sure I've gone through the motions. Jesus weeps. Because he loves us. He wants what's best for us. He wants us to know that He is our Savior and we can trust Him. We need a lamp. In Jesus' final days, He weeps a lot, but He never weeps for Himself. He weeps tears move that people might know why, why He has to do what He's about to do. Jesus looked over that city and he wept for their lack of understanding why they were there. It was Passover. It was a time of remembering how Jesus had delivered them and, and redemption and salvation. And, and the Bible says he goes from there, weeps over the city, he goes from there, he goes into the temple, and people had made a mockery of the temple. They're making profit over sacrifice. They're cheating people out of money they worked hard to have. Instead of the sacrifice having meaning and, and being cared for in the right way, it would become a way of people earning and making a buck. And Jesus began to turn things over. He turns the tables over and he, he clears out the temple. He says, my house will be a house of prayer. The Gospel of Matthew tells us after he did this, he was able to heal people. We need a lamb. The lamb heals us. The lamb rescues us. Nothing has healed my soul apart from the lamb of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's what I know. Sometimes there's tables and there's junk in our life that God wants to turn over. He wants to kick out and we need to let him do it. Jesus also came that day as king. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is our king. We all serve somebody or something. I said at the beginning of the message, the truth of the cross demands a response. It's a reality. Everyone serves something. Even people that are insistent, I don't serve anything. Nothing has master over me. They become their own king. Some people serve, some people serve as things, some people serve a, for a person. But we all need a king. We need a king that will bring us life. In Luke chapter 19, early on, it talks about how Jesus met Zacchaeus. I love the story of Jesus meeting Zacchaeus. A chief tax collector, a guy who ripped everybody off, and he was short. His king was getting as much money as he could. His king was the power he had as chief tax collector. And it wasn't enough. He was taking everything from him. Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem. He's in Jericho on his way. He's getting close. Zach Zacchaeus hears about it, so he climbs a tree because he's too short to see over anybody. He climbs a tree that's going, that goes kind of over the road, I imagine, where he can see Jesus anyway. And Jesus looks up and he sees him. He says, Zach, what are you doing up there? I think Jesus called him Zach. <laughs> and uh, then Jesus says to him, you know, I'm coming to your place for dinner today, so you need to go get it ready. Zacchaeus knew he needed a king. And Jesus knew he needed a lamb. The power of God moved on that dinner. And Zacchaeus gets up and he says, Hey, everybody, I've cheated. I'm paying him back four times what I've cheated him. I bet everybody laughed. Because all his friends were other tax collectors. There was no one else hung out with tax collectors. Except Jesus and other tax collectors. Zacchaeus began to get his, get his stuff together and he began to make amends. He began to pay people back more than what he ever, ever cheated from them. And Jesus said, surely salvation has come to this house today. Zacchaeus let God turn over tables in his life and he said, I'm walking away from it. Do you know when he made that decision, it left him, it left him uh, away from his wealth. But he was as rich as could be because he was with Jesus. And he would witness, he would witness what it meant to have a lamb just a few days later. I think Zacchaeus was in that crowd that day. Jesus said to his whole, his, Jesus' whole message was repent, believe, follow me. Turn from the way you're going because it's not working. You need a lamb. You need a king. Follow me. Let me teach you. Let me guide you. Let me show you. In a minute, Judy's going to come and she's going to sing us a song about the lamb. And I want you to be prayerful and I want you to respond. And if you need to come and pray, come and pray. But I want you to let the Holy Spirit to work on your heart and on your life. I listened to a message not long ago by Pastor Jim Cimbala and, and uh, so much of that message had an impact on me. But one of the things he said in that message, he said, if you want a lamb, if you want a lamb, you got to make him king. You can't have a lamb without letting him be king. If you make him king, he will be the lamb, but you can't have just a lamb and no king. You can't have just a lamb without the king of kings. Man, there have been, there was a season in my life as a young man when I wanted a lamb, but I didn't want the king. I, I was, I had it figured out my own way. I wanted all the benefits of the lamb, but I didn't want to follow the king. And that's no way, that's no way to live. Jesus wants us to repent and believe and follow him. Let him be Lord of your life. Let him be king of your life. 
when you let him be king, you'll have all the benefits of the land. Father, as we hear the words of the song, Lord, I pray that you would help us to respond in obedience. Lord, I thank you for the cross. And Lord, I'm reminded again that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And I thank you for that. In your name, amen.